service this evening. We're glad you're with us. I'm Toby Dukic. I'm the pastor at the Blenner Hassett Church of the Nazarene at 421 Martown Road in Parkersburg, West Virginia. If you don't have a church home and not going to church anywhere, we would love for you to visit with us on Sunday mornings at 1045 and uh, join us in a worship service there as we uh, seek to uh, uh, be all that God wants us to be. Uh, also, if uh, uh, you join us uh, online on Sunday nights, and of course, if you're here with us now, Wednesday night as well. Sunday nights at 6 o'clock and, and Wednesday night at 7, and those are just online services. Uh, and our services on Sunday are also uh, when we're not having trouble, which we've had over the last few weeks, we're trying to get that all resolved. Hopefully it'll be back up and running um, here this coming uh, week or so. So forgive us for that if you join us on Sunday mornings and not being able to hear and get the audio very well. But anyhow, we got a good message for you tonight. And before we get into that message, I do want to go to prayer. I uh, want to continue to remember those that are on our prayer list and, and those we've been praying for on uh, Sunday mornings, and also 
if you have a prayer request there, you can uh, leave it down in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube or whatever you're listening to or watching this video on tonight. Or, or you can uh, also go to our online church platform at uh, bhcotn.online.church. Uh, not only during the service, but anytime after the service as well. And also you can email me at pastortpduke at gmail.com. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads uh, this evening and go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you this evening, we want to just thank you and praise you for who you are. We know you're the creator, the heavens, the earth, the air, the sea, and everything that's within it, Lord. There's... There's times, Lord, where people might think that uh, things as out of things are out of control, but Lord, you are in control, and, and you can take chaos and turn it into order. And we just pray tonight, Father, that you would help us to do the things that we need to do to make that possible, Father. We pray, Father, tonight for all the requests that were mentioned, not only in our Sunday services, but Lord, on our prayer chain as well as those that might be listening listing any prayer requests right now in our comment sections below we pray that your will would be done in each circumstance we pray for the future of the uh, of our election that's coming up here real quick lord we pray that you would have your way in that we pray for those who are affected by the covid 19 whether it's jobs or or the illness itself or family loved ones that have, have come down with it we we pray that you would just be with all these circumstances and situations, Lord. We pray for our president all the way down to our local governments, that you would give them wisdom and guidance in this time. Also, Lord, be with our frontline workers, not only in our hospitals and, and, and fire department and rescue squads and those things, Lord, but also, uh, Lord, especially for our, our police officers and those that... Uh, or on the front lines there. We pray that you would just protect them and, and guide them and their families. Be with all the things going on in our world today. Lord, over all the things that are happening in some of our inner cities and and just uh, ask, Father, that uh, we would just repent and turn from our wicked ways and seek your face that you might heal our land once again. Be with us now, Lord, as we get into this message. May it be something that you challenge us with in our hearts and our minds tonight. And Lord, may we never fail to give you the praise for all that you mean for to us. In Christ's name we pray, and amen, and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, God is good, and he, uh, he, he just uh, watches over us, and, and uh, he really uh, gives us more than, than we uh, deserve. That's for sure. And we're glad. Uh, that, like I said, that you have joined us here this evening. Uh, we pray that uh, it will be a blessing to you. Uh, in our study tonight, I uh, I, I want to look at, uh, I believe, a very important, uh, very important message, a very important. Uh, theological truth if i can use that word with without turning anybody off tonight uh but a very theological truth about the holiness of god the holiness of god our scripture that we're going to focus on this evening along with others but mainly our text will come from Psalms 99. And before we get into the text, I, I would like to share with you uh, something that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism uh, and, and Wesleyan tradition of, of holiness, uh, wrote in his book, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, which was originally published in in 1777, and he, he writes this and makes this statement about no half Christians. <laughs> and, and like I said, this is from his book. A year or two after Mr. Law's, and these are two books, Christian Perfection and Serious Call, would, were put into my hands, they convinced me more than ever 
of the absolute impossibility of being a half-Christian. And I determined through his grace the absolute necessity of which I was deeply sensible of, but I was determined through his grace to be all devoted to God, to give him all my soul, my body, and my substance. Will any considerate man say that this is carrying matter too far, or that anything less is due to him who has given himself for us than to give him ourselves all we have and all we are? What a a powerful statement. What a powerful statement John Wesley put in that book. And that's a powerful book. I, I, I would recommend that book to anyone. But is it possible to be more than half a Christian? What, what, what is half a Christian? In first Peter, In 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, he writes this, and I, I want to I wanna share my, my screen with you this evening. But he, he writes this. He says, therefore, prepare your minds. I, I, I want you to know that's an important statement right there. Prepare your minds for action. Uh be self-control, set your hope fully on grace. Uh, to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not confirm conform, to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Sorry about that. I had a phone call come in there in the middle of all that, and I lost my place for a second. But anyhow... Uh, what what a powerful powerful statement peter gives here and and so he also says in in second peter chapter 2 let me share the screen again with you verses uh, chapter 2 second peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 he writes his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil. I think he has, Peter has something going for us there tonight. And what I'm picking up from what he's saying is, without a doubt, God is a holy God. And I don't think anybody would go against that. God is a holy God. And Peter says that holy God calls you and me to live a life of holiness. And the only way we can do that, and John Wesley made that made the statement in his article there, the only way we can do that is to be partaker, as what Peter in Second Peter there talks about, being partakers of the divine nature. Which means that you and I, as Christians, 
can be more than just half Christians, that we can have the characteristics of God's nature become our very own nature. Stay with me, okay? You see, the whole Bible and really everything in the world and even the universe speaks of and really displays of God's holiness. And as we think about that tonight, I want to go into Psalms 99 here and take a closer look at this psalm and take a closer look how it displays or shows us the holiness of God. Psalms 99, and once again, let me share my screen with you. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equality. In Jacob you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud and, and they kept his statues and, and the decrees he gave them. O oh Lord our God, you answered them. You were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punished their misdeeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. For the Lord our God is holy. Few of us will ever know that few of us will ever know or ever have the kind of awesome experience afforded to that inner circle of Jesus' disciples, Peter, James, and John. When they were with Jesus on what is called the Mount of Transfiguration. And in the book of Matthew, his description of that event states that for just a few moments, Jesus was transfigured from fully man to fully God. Matthew states that Jesus in Matthew 17 uh, verse 2, st he states that Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Standing with Jesus were two who had already experienced life beyond death and worshipped in the very presence of God. Mountaintop experiences have always been a part of man's relationship with God. Biblical examples abound on this. I mean, you had Abraham and where he met with God, the, the provider on the mountain where he took Isaac to be sacrificed. You remember that story, how God intervened 
and provided the sacrifice. And then there was Moses that met with God, the lawgiver, out at on Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were given to him, written on the two, stab, two tablets of stones. And, and, and of course, the, you can't leave out Jesus in all this. Often he met with God the Father on the hillsides and mountains in his times of prayer. And these exciting times drew, drew God and man near to each other when his will was clearly revealed. And here in, in Psalms 99, it reflects David's own mountaintop experience and suggests that it is the holiness of God that defines those who's, who define those wonderful times of fellowship with him. He exhorts the people in verse 9 to exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord, our God, is holy. Now, what I hear David saying here in this passage is that you and I, we too, if you will, are to go on the mountain and experience God's holiness in a personal way in our lives. Just as Abraham, Moses, and Jesus did, you and I, we, are to go to the mountain and there climb up into the holy presence of God Almighty, seeking His will and receiving His numerous blessings. What are those blessings that we will find? Well, first of all, the Scripture talks about the greatness of, of God, verses 1 through 3. You see, the holiness of God will cause us to wonder at his greatness, to be at all, to be all struck. David uses such words as, as awesome in, in verse 3 there. And then in verse 2, he, he used the word exalted over all the nations. And then back in verse 1, he talks about God reigns. The Lord reigns. They let the nations tremble. And he says, he sits what? In throne. He sits in throne. And he speaks of the nations trembling and, and the earth shaking in that verse. And having described God with such words, David sums it all up with one simple, straightforward statement. He but from um, the defining attribute of his character. And remember, we can have a part of that character. God is holy, and he wants you to me to be holy. And so you and I can be partakers of that divine nature. And David is, is here with that one sentence saying, God's greatness isn't from his speaking things into existence and all that, but from the divine, defining attribute of his character, his holiness. Isaiah, one of, the, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, <laughs> Uh, he found himself face to face with the holiness of God. And if you remember in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, he says, My eyes have seen the Lord God Almighty. And I don't know why that didn't show up there, but it didn't. But he says that. And you see, it is on the mountaintop where we find the greatness of God shining through his holy character. Next, we see David talking about the justice of God. That's another aspect of God's holy character that becomes evident to David as he worships at the holy mount. God loves justice. The fact is God's holiness is the source of all justice. He's just because of his holiness. He does not treat anyone different because he's holy. 
true equality, red, yellow, back, black, and white. We may be having that problem here in our, in our midst today from, from certain individuals, not everybody. I don't think it's, I don't think it's systemic as, as people think or say or what you might hear on, on the news. But God's holiness is the source of true equality, and it flows from him. Paul chisels away the barriers that you and I erect when he writes in Romans 10, 12, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone, he doesn't, he doesn't discard anyone, but anyone who calls out in repentance will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And David embraces this holy character trait by God's justice as something you and I can count on. Verse 4, he says, God does what is just and right. You know, that I, I think that's some of our problems today is that 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 People can't come to the truth of owning up when we do wrong. We have a hard time admitting our sin, our wrongs. But God does just and right. Did, did God, God did it for Jacob, and he'll do it. The same thing for you and me. And David says that when he came to the mountaintop, or when we come to the mountaintop, we discover God can be counted on. He is just because he is holy. Next, we see the faithfulness of God in verses 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. David looks to the history of God's dealing with his people. And as he does, he sees a God that has never failed to answer when approached. Verse 6 talks about the experience of Moses and Aaron as they led God's people out of slavery and into the promised land and that God never failed and always answered their cry for help even in their disobedience. And then there's Samuel. He talks about Samuel. Samuel called upon God as a child, and God answered him faithfully and, and communicated his will to him. And then verse 7, whether it was a still small voice or a pillar or a cloud of, and, and fire, God was always there. When his people needed them or needed him. And folks, he's there today. When you and I need him, all we have to do is call out to him. If we're a sinner today, all we have to do is, is say the A, B, C, and D of prayer of repentance. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross and sitting at the right hand of the Father because he was rose, He raised from the dead. C, confess your sin to the Father and ask Jesus into your heart. And D, with the Holy Spirit living in you, turn away from your sin. You see, God is still there for us to call on him. In our, in our circumstances and situations and problems of life, we need to call out to God. He's there. We just need to call out to him. And notice David's emphasis on the obedience to God's decrees and statues there in the second part of that verse 7. They kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. You see, Jehovah's faithfulness, God's faithfulness, is for those who are willing to commit themselves to his way through obedience. You see, faithful obedience to him and his faithful response 
is holiness. And last this evening, David shares with us the forgiveness of God in verses 8 and 9. The forgiveness of God. You see, the hallmark of God's holy character is his forgiveness and his mercy. Not giving us what we deserve, but taking our place that we might have eternal life. You see, repeatedly through the Old Testament, Israel forsook God and and left to worship other gods and other nations and 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 was was disobedient and and throughout the time of judges the time period where god's people were led by judges they would forget god and slide into the sinful pagan cultures that surrounded them often Enduring the consequences of slavery and destruction that comes with such disobedience. But in that time, in those times, they begged God to deliver them. I think of when they was in bondage in Egypt. The scripture says that they just cried out. It doesn't say they cried out to God. They just cried out and God heard their prayer and sent Moses. God responded during the time of judges, sending Deborah and Barak and, and Ehud and other judges and Judges 3 and five, through 5. And, and, and those judges led them out of their self-imposed impression, oppression. You see, David, David was the recipient of this great gift of God's holiness. And he sings heartily, Praise the Lord in one, Psalms 103, verse 2 and 4. O oh, my soul, forget not all his benefits. He who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases, who redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. David, in all of his disobedience, and sin when he cried out to the Lord he heard him and forgave him and verse 9 of our text tonight in Psalms 99 it says for the Lord our God is holy the Lord our God is holy and because of that God forgives because of it he is holy and he forgives because he's holy. As we come to a close this evening, I just want to share with you uh, a special prayer. And as we come to that prayer, I want to ask you a question. Have you gone to the mountain and experienced God's holy presence in your life? I'm not talking about the forgiveness of sins. You see, that's just half of it. (laughs) That's what John Wesley was talking about, half Christians. Because when I was just a forgiven Christian, I still had desires and things that came from within that drove me to not want to do the things I wanted to do and ended up doing the things I didn't want to do. I'm not talking about forgiveness of sins. I'm talking about partaking in the divine nature of God and being cleansed from the, ner- and from the nature that drives you to sin. You see, as I read to you in the opening from John Wesley, can you see of the absolute impossibility of being half a Christian? 
as you, or as he, John Wesley, determined. But have you determined through God's grace the absolute necessity to be all devoted to God, to him? To give him all your soul, your body, your substance? I say to you as he said to himself, John Wesley, will you consider it man or person or woman that this is carrying matter too far? Is it carrying it too far to say that God wants us to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ? Or that anything less is due to him, to Jesus, who has given himself for us than to give him ourselves completely and totally, all we have and all we are. You see, what I get from John Wesley's statement there is, the bottom line is, as Christians, if we profess that in our lives tonight, you and I are to go to the mountain. And there climb up into the holy presence of God Almighty, seeking His will and receiving His numerous blessings. And so as we close in prayer this evening, I, I want to just give you the opportunity to call out to God and ask Him, is there any wicked way in me? Have I truly surrendered my all to you? Heavenly Father, as we come and ask ourselves this, to me, this very important question, I pray, Father, that you would guide us and direct us in where we need to go and be. Lord, we know that you are holy. And there's no question about that. And there's no question that you call your people to be holy. The question is, have I had that mountaintop experience? Have I come to a place in my Christian walk where I have surrendered my will to your will in a complete and total manner. Not that as we read in John Wesley's letter more than what we read tonight, not that we never are tempted, but because of your grace and because of your divine nature being in us as fully devoted followers of Jesus tonight, that we can experience a life free from committing sins. Help us to see that tonight. And if anyone here needs that prayer and wants someone to pray with them, may they seek that person out. Maybe it's a friend, a family member, a loved one, a pastor, or myself here if you need that prayer tonight. And if you're not a Christian tonight and you want to make a decision for Jesus Christ, I'd be willing to pray with you as well. Go with us, Lord, tonight as we depart and go our separate ways. Bring us back to the next appointed service. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen and amen. Well, God bless you, and we just want to say thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I, I, I know I want him to hear my prayer, and I know you want him to hear your prayer. And if you need any, anything that I can help you with in praying, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. God bless you, and uh, really have... Uh, a great rest of the week. God bless you.